Welcome to the Pick Up The Flow show. I'm Salwa. And today my guest is John Barkley. Hi, John. <laughs> Hi, Salwa. How are you doing? Good. And you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for being here. Um, before we start the conversation, can you introduce yourself? Sure. My name is John Barclay. I live here in Brooklyn. Um, I run a bar called Bossa Nova Civic Club in Bushwick. I have a nightclub in bed just a few blocks away called Paragon. And I have a uh, Yerba Mate soda company called White Label Yerba Mate. Nice. So, yeah, uh, where are you originally from? I grew up uh, all over the U.S. I, uh, my mother is from New York mm -hmm. and my father is from Alabama. And uh, my father was in the Marine Corps. So I was born uh, in a town right outside of Anaheim, which is close to L.A., mm -hmm. in California called Tustin, uh, where I moved pretty much immediately. I lived in uh, Hawaii after that, and then I lived in Pensacola, Florida. I moved back to California, 29 Palms, like where Joshua Tree is out in the desert. And then I moved uh, to Jacksonville, North Carolina, Huntsville, Alabama. I moved back to uh, North Carolina for college and then to Brooklyn. I've been here, I think, 17 years or so. Oh, wow. Something like that. But so why, why were you moving a lot? Because my, my dad was in the uh, military and uh, he would get uh, transferred pretty often. That's like a pretty standard, like, military, you know, thing in the United States is you often move every couple years. Well, so, like, at that time, how were you, like, as a kid? Mm -hmm. what, what were your aspirations and dreams? <laughs> Uh, I mean, they were always shifting, you know, I wanted to be like a professional basketball player or, you know, I don't know, like, you know, really kind of outlandish things. I was never like a well, particularly, ugh, particularly career driven uh, kid either. So I was mm -hmm. more kind of focused on. Uh, having fun and getting into trouble and stuff versus, uh, you know, a career, I suppose. And uh, so uh, at what time were you interested in music? Because you, you, you have, I think in, on in an interview, you mentioned that like you had bands, right? Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've always been very interested in music, but then I started playing music uh you know middle school i played in the middle school band i played the drums i played in marching band and then i uh from there uh you know i begged my mom for a drum kit she got me <laughs> a a decent starter drum kit and then i started playing in like at the time you know like grunge music was like really the yeah. thing you know nirvana and Uh, stuff like that and uh, yeah that was my beginning in terms of like really falling in love with I guess the music world wow so uh, uh, were you so how old were you at that time you said uh, when I started playing in like grunge bands uh, probably like seventh eighth grade so I, maybe 13 13 I don't really know the exact i'm not uh, great with numbers but something like that very early teens i believe and then were you like uh were you thinking about new york like did you know new york uh, i would come here to visit when oh, i was wow. a kid um so i grew up i guess primarily on military bases or or close to them which feel very very different than new york city Um, so I'd never really lived in like what I would call a real city 
until mm-hmm. I lived here. So when I was a kid and we would visit uh, family up here with with my mother, I was it was always, you know, beyond mesmerizing to to say the least. And um, I don't know that when I was like a really young kid when I was visiting that I put too much thought into if I wanted to live here or not. But when I was in, you know, like high school and college, you know, I felt uh, I was more kind of into the uh, creative parts of society, specifically music. But uh, at that point, I was like, yeah, maybe I don't want to be, you know, living in rural uh Mm. eastern north carolina and uh yeah eventually said why not try new york city nice i've been here ever since wow so when did you move to new york i moved to new york i think in 2005 Mm -hmm. some sometime around there i don't know if that adds up with the 17 years thing are you any good at math somewhere (laughs) around there yeah somewhere i hope i'm not like seven (laughs) to ten years off with what i said but i think i'm kind of close but sometime around 2005 is when oh wow so when you came here did you have like a community or did you know a few people or i knew a few people very very few and i moved up here with a couple of friends as well um that i was playing music with uh and then i made uh a lot of new friends, you know, mostly people mm-hmm. uh, kind of in my, uh, you know, bracket of, you know, creative people moving yeah. to New York in their, you know, early, mid-20s uh, for a taste of something a little different than how they grew up. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of people from all over the world and a lot of people from the city as well. Nice. And so at that time... Like you were going out, like, did you see like a shift in like the music uh, scenes? Oh, yeah, I've seen, right? I've seen a thousand shifts. It never oh. stops <laughs> shifting. But like when I moved here, kind of the, uh, I feel like, you know, I, I lived uh, in the south side of Williamsburg. And one of the things that was like kind of oddly popping off at the time was kind of like a northern soul revival or something. To me, it sounded oh. like Chubby Checkers or something like 1950s music, you know, like do the mm. twist or something. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck is this? This is so weird. But it's like all these, you know, kind of like elite uh, hipsters mm. and there would be big parties and stuff. But there was all types of stuff. And uh, I think kind of like the more uh, notable thing to maybe say about it is when I moved here, there was uh, the scenes, I suppose, were not, at least to me, felt way less focused on stuff. So you would go to like a loft party or a rooftop party in, in Williamsburg and there'd be like, uh, you know, like a doom metal band Whoa. and then like a hip hop DJ Whoa. after it or like a, uh, you know, I can remember like showing up at a party and there would be like, you know, an alt country singer songwriter and then, you know, like a, 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 a punk band or like an electro house DJ or something. Whoa. Uh, after that and that was uh, that was very interesting there was you know people were taking a lot more risks Mm. and I think you were more way more likely to like encounter some sort of art that you didn't like at all like a lot of it was just horrifyingly Mm. terrible I suppose but you were always uh learning about new stuff you were always exposed to kind of new things whereas now especially Mm. in the the you know dance world that i think both of us are primarily in it it's become 
so focused. Like yeah. you can go to a, uh, let's just say a rave, but yeah. this exists with, you know, different uh, mediums as well. And the rave can have three rooms and like every artist is playing at the same BPM. Yeah. It's like, you know, so razor sharp focus on the genre and yeah. the fashion aesthetic and everything and i think you know like if you know what you like you know what you like but at the same time uh you know brooklyn uh 15 20 years ago mm -hmm. you were exposed to a lot more and i think there was uh you know a, a benefit to that as well for yeah. whatever it's worth and do you think like because you you were living that period of time and you were exposed to so many different genre and music, you feel like it inspired you, like you were more like driven to be part of this world? Yeah, I, th I think so. Uh, wait, wait, ex I, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? I'm like, you know, like I, uh, being in New York at that time, if yeah. it feels like it was kind of like a peak moment because it like, oh, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't expect what you would experience. So it's always Correct. a surprise when you go out. Yes. Was it like something that was uh, exciting for you? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like very, also as a musician exciting. and as a, like being someone in nightlife. Yes. I, I mean, you know, when you grow up in like uh, smaller towns, like there were so many genres that I never even knew uh, existed. I mean, yeah. some of them I, I, I don't lament that I was never exposed to like there was no emo like where i grew up at all there was like no ska <laughs> at all but we had like really bad like kind of new metal and stuff um i'm not sure that really is the best <laughs> way to answer your question but like when you're coming from a uh, uh a smaller and i guess less diverse yeah. place you don't get exposed to everything and I always, and I s still appreciate, you know, um, how much exciting, you know, there's a full spectrum of stimulating experiences from all over the world in New York City, whether it's food or yeah. music, uh, you know, if, if you're down for it, you can just learn and hear and taste new things forever if you're, if you're open to that. Yeah. So at that time, like 2005, six, seven to mm -hmm. 2010, what were, uh, what were you doing like as a job? Uh, I moved here. Well, before then I was, I went to school for, for journalism mm -hmm. and I was writing, uh, in North Carolina for what was like a small town, like bi-weekly. It was, you know, like a, uh, a, a more watered down small town version of like a village voice oh, wow. so i was doing like kind of like infotainment stuff like oh there's a new <laughs> bar and grill oh. that opened up or this place has uh you know open mic nights and i would uh write about it and i came here i immediately uh i had to get a job immediately so i got a job in publishing uh from a uh from a temp agency oh, wow. and I, I had like a really, uh, uh, yeah, my, my job was almost data entry for a while working, uh, for this publishing company that I worked for, for, I want to say like a year and a half. Uh, I originally, I was putting together expert witness directories. I mean, this is what? Like, <laughs> as, as boring wow. as uh, a conversation could get. <laughs> So I'll spare you. But then I did uh, like, uh, what was it? Uh, magazine ad production. It was all in like a cubicle and, you know, like Gramercy Park, oh. Murray Hill area. Uh, and, uh, and then I uh, felt very unsatisfied in my life and... Uh, I started doing uh, like production assistant and photo assistant work uh, on all types of shoots. I did some photo researching work um, and then I started bartending 
uh, just because the money was better. Mm. And then from there, I got into, uh, oh, what if we started throwing raves? That's how, that's how oh. it really kind of started in New York City. So was it me. at that time when you started, like you were involved with 285, Kent? Yeah, so I worked at a place called Trophy Bar that yeah. was on Broadway that um, a lot of uh, people probably don't remember, but it was at the time kind of like the mecca for the very, very small kind of uh, alternative dance scene yeah. or whatever you want to call it. You know, Kim Ann Foxman used to DJ there. I saw Light Asylum play there. Ron Morelli and basically everybody from Lies would DJ on like a Tuesday night or something. Whoa. No <laughs> subwoofers, you know. Whoa. Capacity of the place is like maybe 70 people. And, Whoa. you know, at the time, everybody's getting paid like $15 and like three drink tickets or whatever. Yeah. the DJ and that was kind of the first time that I saw I was like okay there's some actual movement towards something that like feels really uh great mm -hmm. to me and we had this idea what if we move these some of these some of the spirit in these parties and this style of music to a warehouse mm -hmm. and so we got uh we signed a lease at 285 Ken And that's how that started. Uh, for me, uh, if people aren't familiar, it was like a DIY warehouse spot that I only had mm. for, I want to say, I, I, we were open like maybe seven months and I got in a lot of trouble with NYPD. I got arrested for that. Oh. And uh, then I sold the lease to Todd P., and some of his people who turned it into like uh they had it during the golden era yeah really. for sure so yeah. then it was like oh grind and yeah, asap rocky <laughs> and all this crazy stuff there's like a whole oh. documentary about it but i uh we did just like you know exclusively ravier stuff there mm -hmm. uh I got in trouble and uh, yeah, again, Todd P and them, they ran it for several years and they really, uh, you know, they're, they're the real people behind uh, the real movement that 285 Kent, but I did have uh, some involvement in, in the beginning. And then from that, mm -hmm. We said, oh, you know, just because you got arrested, like, don't uh, give up. There's like a lot of movement. And we did another DIY spot in Deep Bushwick called Trip House. Yeah. Which was this like 21 bedroom or something uh, like Victorian mansion where we would just kind of assign any, you know, an artist per room, like do your own weird <laughs> thing with no budget. So people would be in there like naked drawing with crayons or something. I don't know. Right. Uh, and then from there, uh, I kind of stumbled upon uh, the space that Bossa Nova's in and, um, convinced some people to invest in it and we opened oh Boston. wow so when was that that was uh we officially opened in 2012 Boston. oh wow and mm. so at that time were you like kind of anxious you were like oh no i'm not sure i want to do this like were you scared i was definitely scared yeah i mean yeah. i'm still scared it's a very uh volatile business to say the least there's a new emergency uh I'm sure anybody who's involved in kind of the nightlife or mm -hmm. the arts world uh, can relate. But yeah, I was definitely, I was definitely scared. I mean, one of the thing at the time, I mean, obviously New York City has had some giant waves of dance music that, mm -hmm. you know, really blow everything that's happening now yeah. fully out of the water. But at the time, there was almost nothing happening in this uh, in this yeah. genre, and 
you know, for, for whatever it's worth, is mostly because the government shut everybody down that was attempting to do it. Mm-hmm. So we really kind of rolled the dice on the the dance music stuff. We didn't know if they were going to shut us down, which they did, of mm-hmm. course. Um, and we also didn't know if it would if if they're the you know scene or whatever, for lack of a better term, was big enough to sustain a place as small as Bossa at mm-hmm. the time. It felt like there was maybe only 200 people in the city that were kind of interested in, you know, like the hipster techno thing or whatever the fuck mm. we want to, you know, call it retroactively, mm-hmm. um, which which sounds crazy because now there's like kind of, you know, 20 bajillion <laughs> venues yeah. that specialize in this That's, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, but at the time we were, you know, every bar of that size in in North Brooklyn, like what was happening is like they would play like, you know, uh, like kind of like tongue in cheek, like 90s R&B yeah. classics every weekend night, uh, you know, like Belle Bib DeVoe or, you know. I, I don't even know, uh, ludicrous or something. Mm-hmm. And everybody would, you know, have kind of like an ironic yet fun time. So we kind of thought like, you know, maybe this techno thing is, is not going to work, but we want to try it. Mm-hmm. When we first opened up, we were doing hip hop parties there as well. We were doing reggaeton stuff. And, uh, because we were the only place that was doing house and techno, mm-hmm. That's what everyone came for. Yeah. So people didn't come to the to you know the other stuff because there were some other options. Yeah. For it, but we were very, uh, I guess, kind of open minded and and cautious about the dance music stuff mm-hmm. when we opened it, and it ended up catching on mostly because we were the only people in town mm-hmm. uh, like willing we- to do it. I suppose. Yeah, were you seeing like a? Were you realizing that like something was happening culturally? Like, like you were fostering this, like community that later, you know, it's like it's, it. It had such an impact on culture because at Basa, like so many. I mean, I met so many friends that are now uh, sure. very successful, and now it's like trendy, like the music that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it's definitely way more popular but i mean at the time it just kind of felt like uh you know like a bunch of us kind of dorks like had our own little clubhouse or whatever to kind of experiment with and stuff and then as things you know progressed then it was a a little eye-opening for Mm -hmm. sure yeah and i think uh, um yeah i'm curious about like you talked about finding so you had people invest, like, were they asking you, you know, like to give, uh, like, um, I don't know how you call it, like reports or. No, what? not so. I mean, yeah. our entire operation and anybody who knows me knows I'm not like a, you know, a really organized or like, uh, particularly, uh, business minded uh, person, but yeah, it was, it was not the most professional approach to, uh, opening a business. And we, uh, learned a lot of lessons along the way. Um, so I think if I went to like, you know, I, I pitched this to like more seasoned, uh business people investors or whatever they'd be like get the fuck out of my face (laughs) right now like call the cops on me (laughs) or something but uh so i i I was more uh what's the word here I, i i was more uh effective at sort of convincing people that kind of saw these things with their own eyes like mm-hmm. let me take you to this warehouse party yeah and you can see you know like 400 people in there like just having this weird half naked 
<laughs> cathartic experience that they're not having in these, you know, uh, upscale uh, cocktail grilled cheese bars yeah. or whatever. And uh, yeah, that's, you know, kind of uh, we made it kind of happen more on feelings and uh, just uh, it was it was a, it was clearly a, a giant risk well, <laughs> that anybody involved with anything, any of my businesses, but also anybody in nightlife or culture yeah. to invest your money or your time in. You know, you know, it's uh, it's very risky. And I think you have to really kind of believe in it to some degree to mm -hmm. to commit to it, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's yeah. And was it like at that time, was it just you? You had the team, right? Like, how did you find people? Uh, well, a few, a uh, few of the people I worked with at Trophy Bar. I don't know if you remember Adam. Yeah. 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 Who managed the place with yeah. me for a while. Um, Mike, who still oh, yeah. manages Abasa and Paragon. He had been helping me with, you know, this DIY stuff where we would essentially, you know, you know, risk going to jail for like $60 each mm -hmm. or whatever for a few years, just kind of for the excitement of it. Um, and then most of the other people involved, uh, I kind of met along the way. Mm. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, do you have like any, can you share any memorable moments at Bossa, like souvenir of like, that like marked your, you know, like marked you? Uh, yeah, I mean, Bossa kind of, uh, you know, w when it opened, it was very unclear, like I said, what direction it was going to go in or if it would just flop within six months like a lot of places mm -hmm. do. I didn't really have the resume. Really, none of us did. So there was it felt like there was a good chance, uh, you know, statistically speaking, that it would immediately be a... Uh, you know, uh, humiliating defeat. Mm. Um, but what happened is it kind of coincided with this brand new kind of interest in, in dance music again, coming from like several different sides. So a lot of it was just like super lucky timing and we were lucky enough that no one else was, dumb enough mm -hmm. to try what we did at that time and uh it paid off but it, it went from a point where you know when i started i was cleaning the place myself mopping every day or ev every other day and we had like a very very minimal uh staff where we didn't even have security mm -hmm. on most nights because uh, on a weeknight, it was like, you know, we'd be lucky if maybe 30 people came in. And then all of a sudden, it was like everybody in New York City just went bananas mm -hmm. for dance music again. You know, there was like a, a few breakthrough artists, you know, a few of the like little labels that were, were you know, you know, you're like, this guy is just like the biggest like dork in the world with his little record label. And now all of a sudden, you know, like some of our friends, like all of us were just a bunch of kind of, you know, internet losers or whatever. Then all of a sudden everybody wants a piece of it. And it felt like it just happened like right around 2013, like overnight. Whoa. And then, you know, Bossa was in the New York times yeah. and we got like, paper magazine uh club of the year and all of this stuff and uh you know not only my project but i think kind of everybody mm -hmm. involved you know disc woman yeah. came up out of nowhere and now they're in all the news yeah. and we're like what the fuck this is <laughs> insane uh i forget where i was going with this but 
uh, it, you know, so, you know, we're in the New York Times. All of a sudden there's like a line around the block. And then, mm. you know, the police are interested in us, the fire department, all the bad stuff that comes with it. And so it was a pretty uh, abrupt, uh, abrupt shift. Um, wow. So how did you deal with that? Because at that time, you know, it was still illegal to dance, right? Sure, yeah. So how did you deal with, like, the police, like, the you know, the threat of, like, yeah. you know? I mean, they essentially shut us down for an entire year. Uh, we had to, uh, um, they required, and in their defense, I think they were right about this, that we uh, uh, needed to make some changes to the building. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did that and it, you know, we had to aggressively monitor our capacity and all of our operations for over a year. I got, I actually have been to court several times for allowing dancing in that place. And, uh, you know, at the time uh, that uh, everyone organized the cabaret law repeal, mm -hmm. I mean, it was uh, all dance music, all dance clubs, whatever in New York City were under threat, you know, mm -hmm. from fire department, department of buildings. They were just like, yeah, we're really literally not going to allow anyone to dance. Mm -hmm. And, you know, arguably the you know, most influential dance city in the entire world. Mm -hmm. um, so like uh, when, uh, so you, you, uh, uh, you were involved in the repeal of the Cabarello? Correct. So yes. What was your, um, contrib like, what did you do? Um, well, like I said, after the ghost ship fire, I don't know oh, if yeah. you recall that. Uh, I don't know if everybody else does, but this terrible fire that broke out and killed dozens of people in uh, Oakland at a DIY spot. There was mm -hmm. this all, you know, uh, governing agencies in this country were like, well, we don't want that to happen Mm -hmm. on our watch so instead of a lot of them being like how can we make these places safer yeah. to prevent that they said how about we just end uh any sort of event in this genre uh, to prevent this from happening so they were threatening to shut a number of places down uh that allowed dancing, which was illegal at the time. Mm -hmm. So we said, hey, you know, people have been uh, attempting to fight this law for basically 100 years, um, but there hasn't been, like, uh, necessarily, like, an event to really uh, rally people behind, and now is the event, you know? Uh, and at the same time, uh, we found out that there was a, uh, a city council member, mm -hmm. Raphael Espinal, who's the guy at the, at the, the podium there oh, yeah. in the photo who happened to be a big fan of, uh, you know, the dance world and was, uh, interested in, you know, pushing this this repeal. So me and, you know, some of those people you can see in the photo, Frankie mm -hmm. from Disc Woman, Nikki Brown, who was at uh, Boiler Room at the time, but also very involved in the dance world. Rachel from Happy oh, yeah. Fun Hideaway, Nicole Brenecki, who oh, yeah. had a, uh, uh, a dance, a techno label and is, New York a uh, pretty yep, yep. cutthroat uh, attorney. We all grouped together. Mm. Uh, we formed our advocacy group, uh, Dance Liberation Network. And then we found out, uh, you know, we made a couple like you know, Facebook posts or whatever bullshit 
you know, through a couple like very small events and we found out, you know, there's groups going back a hundred years uh, that have been trying to fight this. And they said, OK, yeah, we're going to dust off, Whoa. you know, our advocacy uh hats as well and they joined with us everybody joined and uh yeah we eventually got it repealed well that's so, that's historical that's like such yeah. a it's crazy because that like, like like when i came to new york i didn't know that dancing was illegal it's like yeah, yeah, it's, it's like new york city and it, 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 it's like new york city yeah. and afghanistan <laughs> yeah. like the only places where there's <laughs> restrictions on it but then, so how, what was, uh, uh, like, um, what was your take, like, what did you take from this experience? Because it's pretty, it's big, you know, that you contributed yeah. to this. Because uh, a lot of clubs were also active at that time. So were they, why were, like, why clubs didn't coalesce? You know what I mean? Like, why was it just you? Uh, a lot of clubs, a lot of people did help out. Um, a lot of people didn't as well. You know, a lot of people didn't even support us. They thought we were going to make things worse somehow. And uh, they turned out to be fully wrong because now, you know, no place is ever shut down yeah. for allowing dancing. And everybody's basically forgot about it, yeah. which was the plan. Of course, you know, me and... Some of the people I worked with would love if people remembered and we got more attention and we got to feel cooler about ourselves. But the reality is, is like, it, it's, it's over. Like we, we want it and now you're legally allowed to dance. There's still lots of other problems in New York City and the world that are way bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, you know, set out to do a job and we uh we com we completed it i think like my biggest when you ask what did i learn from that mm -hmm. my biggest i think takeaway is that you know there are some things that we can accomplish and with activism mm -hmm. some of them obviously a lot more difficult uh than others, you know, uh, you know, I, I don't know how effective I could be at, uh, you know, pushing for universal health care or, you know, justice in the Middle East, per se, not to say that we shouldn't all push for that stuff, but we all do have uh, a certain amount of access to, mm -hmm. to make change in our worlds and you know what i learned about new york city specifically is that city council for for example they're in charge of i don't know what the number is but uh, billions of dollars in budget Whoa. and a lot of these people that are on city council are you know uh in their 30s some of them are in their 20s uh, some of them are very progressive. A lot of them are very, very approachable. You can just uh, call and set up a meeting with your uh, your local rep, your local city council member, mm -hmm. and in theory, make some real changes uh, locally. And in theory those changes uh, spread to other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, I don't know if there still is, but there used to be a Black Panther on city council. There's lots of, you know, very progressive young people, queer people, mm -hmm. people of all different backgrounds. Uh, I'm friends with uh, our council member at uh, Paragon, bed Chi Chi Ase, who's, I believe, the youngest city council member to, to ever be appointed. He's young, mm. queer, black. He's one of very few people in New York City politics that publicly called for a ceasefire. Mm. 
Uh, I'm hoping he runs for uh, for uh, for mayor and president yeah, one day. But it 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 can be done. He enjoys nightlife. Uh, yes. You've probably been in the same room as him before and not even realized. But again, what I learned is that there are things we're not necessarily as hopeless as mm. uh, as uh, we've been led to believe. I guess mm -hmm. is what I've learned. So, um, during the pandemic, Bassa experienced the fire. So, how was how was the experience of like having to go through, you know, the um, also the thought of maybe having to close Bassa or yeah, I mean, it, it, there was really nothing good about it at all. It was very scary when it happened. Uh, you know, a woman almost died. Uh, this was all on Bossa is, uh, on the ground floor of a, a mixed use building. So it has, uh, apartments above it and a mm -hmm. fire, uh, caught on the third floor where there was a woman sleeping in her bedroom. So Bossa never actually caught on fire. The building did, the but then the damage from, uh, the fire and the water that was used to put it out just totaled oh my God. Oh. bossa so i mean it was terrifying uh and you know personally and professionally devastating i suppose mm -hmm. for me and anybody else uh involved uh i was very glad to find out no one died because it was a very uh close call situation but yeah i mean it was it really sucked we went into a lot of debt to to reopen it took a lot of time uh it ended up being a lot more work uh than i had uh planned for i guess or anybody doesn't really plan for something like that and for you know half a year it was unclear if there was any path to uh reopen uh but we did mm -hmm. and uh it's kind of running almost the exact same way as yeah. it always did so i'm i'm very happy about that part i suppose nice and was it at the so shortly after you opened paragon it's a different uh, venue. Uh, how would you call it? Like a club, bar? I mean, uh, technically, it's a bar restaurant, but I think most oh. people experience it as a, as a, like a dance club. You know, it's two and a half uh, stories. I call it like a, a mini mega club because yeah. it has different rooms. You know, it's kind of like... A, I've never been to like a visa or something, but it's what I imagine. <laughs> you took true, like an Ibiza yeah. club and <laughs> put it in like the honey I shrunk the kids <laughs> machine and made it way smaller. But it it's it's been a essentially a discotheque for at least forty or fifty years, so it has kind of like a classic New York City dance club look to it with the mezzanine yeah. and everything. Yeah, and also it's like, it's it's weird how when you enter, like Paragon, you have a, a feel of Bassa as well. Sure, yeah. You know, it's like you kept uh, the signature. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple yeah. uh, design elements, uh, you know, the globe pendant lighting and um, yeah. the checkered floors that were already there. Yeah. Stuff and like that. We have the same lighting guy. Michael Potvin, Nightmind, nice. same sound guy, yeah, uh, Marshall Hansen, sub bass systems. And um, we, you know, share a lot of the same teams, Bossa and Paragon. And so why, why did you open Paragon? What was your, what, what was the reason? Uh, I mean, there's a few reasons. One is I had always loved this space. Mm -hmm. and I always wanted to do something bigger. Um, and I, you know, a lot of the artists that I guess started 
I, you know, kind of in the early era of Bossa kind of outgrew the space. So, you know, somebody like, let's say, you know, Juliana Huxtable or, you know, uh, Volvox or um, mm. Honey Dijon, DJ Stingray. Yeah. Artists that played Bossa maybe uh 11 years ago or something like they can't play in a room that size anymore so i was like oh what if we had a bigger <laughs> spot for the people you know yeah. for like the marquee names or whatever nice i have a little video uh of paragon so that was boiler room right yes that's boiler room there nice so how like have you seen like a shift in the crowds Oh, for sure, yeah. I mean, all types of shifts. But the, the big thing I guess I'll say about Paragon is uh, uh, it's not like people, you know, I, mm. I'm 41 now. I'm not, uh, I shouldn't really be going out so much at all. But even people, you know, eight years younger than me or so, uh, They don't go out quite as much as people in their 20s. Mm -hmm. And uh, the ones that do have, I, I think they have, uh, generally speaking, like a loyalty to some of the, uh, the venues that beat us to it. You know what I mean? Like, uh, mm -hmm. so venues like uh, nowadays in basement that I both, I think both of those are great mm -hmm. clubs. I feel like their crowd is maybe a little older than than Paragon's. And Bossa too, Bossa's crowd for whatever reason is a little older than Paragon's. Oh, wow. But it's like, uh, you know, one thing I learned really quick is like, Paragon wasn't going to work me like building my dream nightclub, you know, because mm. people in my demographic, we go out like, you know, once every That's two good. months, <laughs> order one drink, you know, critique everything yeah. and then get to Boom, bed. Yeah. Whereas like the people who are really going out and mass are like, you know, 26 year old kids. And mm -hmm. so we've had to uh really kind of uh re uh reassess some yeah. of the bookings and the just the general uh i guess marketing and uh creative direction of the place because you know you can book somebody that you know like maybe you or me would uh, minds would be blown to have this booking But the reality is, like, a lot of these 26-year-old kids couldn't possibly yeah. care less. Which I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. Because when I moved here and I was in my, you know, mid-20s, I really couldn't possibly have cared less about what some, you know, uh, grumpy, you know, 41-year-old balding guy thought about... Uh, what nightlife should be. I wanted to go out and just yeah. really have fun with my friends and kind of uh, carve uh, my own path. So we're kind of at a point where we're saying, okay, yeah, maybe we should listen to you little brat yeah. kids a little more. <laughs> and for the most part, I, th I think that they're, uh, I, I don't have many uh, problems, I guess, with the younger generation i do know that they really tend to if you can get them in front of good music they will thoroughly enjoy it yeah but it is more difficult like speaking their language to get them out in the first place i think yeah if that makes any sense i'm not sure if that's it's true but have you seen like a shift after covid i feel like people Yeah, going out, like, it's, I think because people have so so many choices. Oh, yeah, that you know? too. And I feel like people don't care anymore. Whereas, like, I remember at Bossa, like, the time of Bossa, like, yeah. you would be excited. You'd be, oh, my God. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Confuse the house. We have to go right now. Like A thousand percent. And um, 
But yeah, I'm really curious because your social media, like, uh, for example, the Bossa account mm. is very meme driven. Sure, yeah. And then Paragon is more like, yeah, you see the creative direction. There's more like a strategy. Sure, yeah. And like this, like branding. Yeah. yeah. So who's behind the creative directions of both? Uh, I mean, Bossa, it's just me uh, on, <laughs> you know, well. finding memes and posting it. <laughs> That's basically it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I, I, I never even heard the term like creative director until several years after Bossa opened. Uh, you know, it, the, it was a very, very uh, streamlined operation. So we didn't well. we never had discussions like that. Uh, Paragon, you know, we have to run it like we un- unfortunately Mm -hmm. The model, we have to sell a lot of tickets in order to even approach breaking even. So we have to kind of think about branding, marketing, not only, you know, kind of marketing to people that live in the neighborhood, which we kind of can do with, uh, we have the privilege of, that's all we have to really think about with Bossa, but with with Paragon, we have to think about people who would actually spend a little bit of money in order mm-hmm. to 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 keep the place open. It's a much much more expensive operation. So we're hoping to like bring in tourists <laughs> and yuppies, yes. and not just like the kids with the cool haircuts and the shaved eyebrows who spend zero dollars. You know. <laughs> yeah, but how how does it feel because? You know, during Bossa, you had bands. You had, you were actually part of Dust. Sure, this, yeah. Uh, techno project. Would mm-hmm. you call it a techno project? Yeah, I would call it uh, a techno project, but there might be a better word for it too. Um, it was... So, so how long have you been in Dust? Uh, well, we're not doing. We haven't done anything in several years, but. Uh, yeah. I feel I don't I'm not great with dates, but I feel like we started it, you know, maybe 2014 or yeah. something. Yeah. I have like a little video uh, photo. Yes. So that's you, uh, Michael uh, Sherburn and. Um, um, Green, Green jellyfish. jellyfish. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So how like was it because at the time you had Bossa mm-hmm. as well, like was it for you like an escape? Like why, I mean, obviously you were into music since you were a teen. Yeah. Like, um, was it something you really wanted to pursue? Like, Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. I think always, uh, I've never really had, uh, I've been playing music forever mm-hmm. and I've never really had any financial success with it or i i never there was never the threat of this becoming a career Mm -hmm. but it's always been something that uh was a lot of fun for me and uh yeah an escape uh whatever uh all of the things that i think most people uh, who gravitate towards music are into Mm-hmm. I still, you know, I, I mess around. I, you know, uh, recorded some pretty awful, like, experimental music for the first time in a few weeks last night. And it it feels amazing nice. to do. Yeah. And, you know, for, uh, I, I've got a, you know, there's so many flaws and, uh kind of the music industry or the music scene or whatever, but I've always felt liberated by the fact that I didn't think I could really make a career out of it. So I always kind of just do what I want to do with music. I've accepted I'm not going to be, you know, some, you know, world touring, uh, you know, musician. So I just record music uh, that feels good to me to record and I used to play music that felt good to to play uh and then I kind of like balanced the business 
kind of aspects with, uh, you know, other elements in my life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so inspiring because I feel like uh, the, you know, young kids, like new people who might see you mm -hmm. as like, you know, the bus of Paragon and Bassa, like they don't, they might not know that you have this like background in music and yeah. you release on very like big labels, like Mankind Records yeah. and 2MR. Mm -hmm. Like you, in 2019, you released your own uh, solo project, uh, Liquid Soap. Yes. So... Yeah, how does it feel? Like, do you feel like you're, you have two selves? Like, two hot, like... Right now, yeah. no, I feel like I just have one yeah. <laughs> self. I'm like an indentured <laughs> servant to the nightlife yeah. business. Damn. But, you know, for a while, uh, I did, to a degree, I think, feel a, a dichotomy, I suppose. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And were they like, uh, did you find any, like, how did you balance, you know, your responsibilities between like managing the club mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and doing your own projects? Like, uh, I mean, I, I've never been very good with balance in general. I'm mm -hmm. typically like pretty stressed out and way behind on deadlines with everything in my life but you know music stuff it was always just for fun mm -hmm. so it was like we were never like a serious touring band uh you know we never had any like serious uh what would you call it like uh responsibilities with like recording contracts or anything mm. it was always kind of like oh if we all have you know we're three busy people but if we have the time let's uh let's record for a few hours or if we have the time let's play the show okay. and it was always so much fun to me what? uh And I think in part because it was never like a serious kind of career thing. But, you know, the 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 very limited touring that we did where I got to go to like, you know, places for the first time in my life. You know, like Warsaw or Mexico City. And, you know, we didn't make really any money, but mm -hmm. you're getting to see a new city yeah. and you're getting to perform with all these weirdos from different parts of the world to me that's like some of the best memories of my life and well, you know i would pay to to be able to do that again you know when i when i travel now obviously i like getting out of new york city yeah. but uh that was just you know so magical uh to be able to do a few times a year um and uh i don't regret any of it at all and being in a club because like for, for i think right now you're more like you're at paragon every day right basically yeah not the bossa well i use paragon kind of as my office for everything but i will say that like the vast majority of my time is uh spent on paragon stuff because it's well, a, a much more complex business model than Than the other stuff currently like for instance what what do you do like in a week a lot of booking a lot of dealing with you know authorities which is relentless dealing with attorneys dealing with landlord issues uh dealing with tech stuff dealing with the building and everything that goes with that dealing now we're like oh, okay you know we have to focus a little bit on marketing and mm. updating the website and coming up with content, mm -hmm. ticketing, all types of stuff. Well, and that's you and you have a team. Yeah, we have a we have a good team over there. Oh, nice. And so um, do you want to like like have you have you have you thought of like expanding one of the clubs or like do you What's next with Bassa and Paragon? I mean, I, I have my hands beyond full right now. Yeah. Uh, I think I bit off a little more than 
I could chew. Um, so I have absolutely no plans on any sort of <laughs> further expansion for the foreseeable future. I'm more concerned with how can we run these places a little better because I, I kind of walked into all these spots like, yeah, we can do this, you know, no problem, you know. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, problems, I suppose, that we're, we're still figuring out. Oh. I mean, the, the one big thing I will say is, well, maybe it's two big things, is mm -hmm. nightlife now versus pre-COVID or pre-lockdown mm -hmm. is way more complex and way more difficult. You've probably seen a lot of people's, you know, Facebook or Instagram rants, which they're just tired of it. Yeah. Uh, it's just really uh, stressful from all angles. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it, and this is, I have really no one else to blame but myself for this, but running a spot like Boss uh, is way, way easier than running a spot like Paragon, you know, oh, wow. in terms of you're in a different category you know, everything from insurance is way more expensive and complex to staffing, uh, to, you know, the AV aspects of it. We have to deal with like riders now at Bossa. We're just like, uh, this, this yeah. is Bossa. <laughs> Take it Take or it leave it. it. Yeah. yeah. You know, we have people like requesting like artist liaisons Whoa. at Paragon and all this stuff. And we have to buy flights on occasion. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my it's, God. Uh, it's so never wait. ending. So now at Paragon, it's uh, like the what's the curatorial approach is like it's in-house. Like it whereas Barca, it's more like anyone with the collective or a party. Can yeah. 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 So, boss, uh, it would it, the general booking protocol is if if you're an artist, you reach out and say, hey, uh, you know, I have a friend in town, and mm -hmm. we would like to do this night together, and then we assign you the entire night, mm -hmm. and you do the marketing for the night, uh, and you know, uh, it's kind of your show for the night. Mm -hmm. Whereas Paragon is uh, a much bigger, uh, you know, both physically and I guess metaphorically or whatever. We are doing uh, all in-house or mostly in-house programming. Um, yeah, so we, well, would, uh, we, would, we would hire you and we have as a DJ mm -hmm. not to take over the entire night. Yeah. If that makes any sense. So, uh, like, how do you stay relevant like how do you um know like you know like do you do research on like who's playing out like how do you know who to book um yeah so i mean we at paragon i oversee booking at both spots yeah at boss uh my booker is named ruby and he's significantly younger than i am a little more uh active in nightlife is a uh um a uh, a customer or whatever he goes out more than i do and at uh paragon i work with stephen clavier and enyo who is uh part of dweller mm -hmm. as well but yeah i mean on occasion i will go out to see some new stuff Uh, but a lot of like online research, uh, okay. a lot of just like talking to people. I'm having to get used to kind of like talking to much younger people, which I kind of thought I was too important to do for a while. And now I'm like begging them, like, please, you know, <laughs> what's cool? <help." laughs> Is it like, uh, how, how do you feel like because you're in the club a lot and you see You listen to the music, like how, mm -hmm. how do you still stay interested? Like, you know? Yeah. I mean, I still love yeah. dance music, techno. I like, I, I still love, uh, I still love all of this stuff. 
it, it is easy for me to get exhausted, but yeah. um, I'm still very interested in it. And as much as I complain about it, I, I don't know. I mean, I do know, I remember when Bossa burnt down, I was pretty, or, or didn't burn, the building yeah. <laughs> caught on fire and we shut down. I was pretty, you know, depressed. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, work is where I get most of my social interaction. Mm. Um, but I, I, I'm sorry, what was your question? I just went on an uh, unhinged rant. No, I about, forgot. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm like, I think it's the light. Yeah. Damn, I forgot. I feel like we've been, uh, we have way too much lighting on us. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm really curious about like, what would you say to like, you know, young people who want to engage in nightlife? Mm -hmm. Like, what would you? Hmm. Uh, I would say, I mean, I love to just yap at people. So I would say a lot of things. I'm trying to think if I can... Uh, uh, what do you call it? summarize? Um, I, I guess I would say, you know, it's, it's can be a lot of fun. It can have a lot of meaning for yourself and for other people. I would say definitely don't make the money, uh, your primary focus because you're going to end up, uh, being very unhappy at some point mm -hmm. more than likely if you're just doing it uh, for this, uh, you know, uh, non-existent uh, pot of gold that we're all <laughs> it's chasing. Yeah. And then I think the other thing I might say is that, you know, one of the things that uh, I've, I've learned uh, and just seems to be more and more relevant every day is like the number one thing people are are going out for there's always kind of like debates about you know like oh that wasn't a a proper dj you know whether it's like some old guy you know with the, the with the hat or whatever <laughs> what are those like old guy scene hats kind of like fedora type things <laughs> Whether they're like hating on, you know, some 30 year old for, you know, using CDJs or the sync button or. Yeah. Or somebody who's 30 hating on, you know, a, a club for the lighting or the sound system or whatever. I would say the main reason people actually go out is not for the music or the lighting or the dj people are going out for people people yeah for social um interaction and it's basically always been that yeah. way if you read about uh you know the beginning of dance music culture in new york city they originally weren't even mixing records they were mm -hmm. playing yeah. the entire songs yeah and you go out to meet people, to yeah. make friends you, as an escape. Yeah. Obviously, music is incredibly important, but the best way to, you know, the most high definition way to experience music is at home yeah. with your <laughs> boutique <laughs> headphones on. You listen to exactly what you want to. Exactly. You can make your own cocktail. Yeah. You can set the... AC exactly where you want. Uh, so a anything beyond that is a is yeah. a step down. You're going out for a social element, yeah. and I run into all these people all the time that are like absolutely incredible uh, DJs or musicians or whatever, and maybe they're just not that likable yeah. for whatever reason. Or they're not into the social element. And they're always confused why some like 24-year-old super nice kid mm -hmm. is like getting booked uh, over them. And, you know, I felt that way, you know, myself as a musician. Mm -hmm. And the main reason I think is uh, right under our nose is because it's first and foremost like a, a social, social yeah experience and you always have to keep that in mind yeah um 
It's so true. It's like when uh, I first came to New York, I didn't know anyone. And then mm. I would go to Basa and I met all of my friends. Yeah, yeah. Like people were so chill and nice. Like I was shy in the corner listening to music. But then you would you would talk to people and then slowly, you know, have a, a community in a way because it's people you would always see at sure. Basa. And also, like, I feel like the work you, you, you do, you know, with the... Like hiring people, like it's it feels like a family, like sure, you know everyone. It's like it dysfunctional family at times, <laughs> but uh, but it makes yeah. the place what it is, you know. Sure, yeah. Like there are some venues where you don't feel that like you know family yeah. vibe, so it feels cold. Sure, and you feel. It's like the same thing where like, you know, maybe there's a better bartender out there that's like, uh, you know, world renowned mixologist. But if she doesn't like uh, if she's not the right personality fit for the bar or the mm. club, uh, you have to take that into consideration as well. Yeah. So. And uh, yeah, speaking of the bar, like you co-founded the White Label Beverage Co., the Correct, Club Mate yes. Drink, with yes. uh, Jesse Rudoy and Julian Duran. Mm -hmm. So what inspired you to like start this company? Uh, so when we, um, when we started Bossa, everybody was like, that was kind of, for me, at least the first wave of everyone being like very Berlin obsessed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I love to hate on Berlin. It's like one of my favorite things to do <laughs> is kind of make fun of, especially like Americans that go over there and cosplay like they're German. I think that's like, yeah, <laughs> so silly <laughs> out of all places yeah. in the world to pretend that you're, uh, it's so true. You know, a, a part of or whatever. Yeah. But that that being said, you know, Berlin definitely deserves uh, credit for, you know, having a, a pretty uh, exciting, um, although sometimes maybe a little narrow uh, nightlife world. Mm -hmm. And at the time we opened Bossa, like if, if, if you're talking about techno, uh, you're talking about Berlin, uh, for better, or for worse. And, uh, you know, I guess I started going to visiting Berlin for the first times, like around 2010 or something. And it's like, when you show up is like, you know, like a idiot American there, <laughs> they're like, Oh yeah, you got to get a mate vodka or you have yeah. to try club mate. <laughs> And uh, I tried it. I was like, oh, yeah, this is cool. It's caffeinated. So you don't have to, you know, shoot up a bunch of meth or whatever <laughs> to stay uh, awake for, you know, their uh, signature Berlin extended hours. Mm -hmm. And when I came back, everybody's like, oh, yeah, did you have Club Mate when you were there? Did you have a Mata? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. And then I thought, like, everybody is just like, so obsessed with this stuff and I, I did like it for whatever it's worth it would be kind of you know neat and novel if we could get it at uh at bossa mm -hmm. and i was you know uh doing some investigative research on the internet and i found out there was like a hacker collective uh that was uh Mate soda is also popular in the hacker community because, uh, you know, uh, the caffeine is conducive to staying up and I guess oh, hacking whoa. into things. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not too much into that world. But anyway, they were importing it uh, to uh, Long Island. So I hit them up. I'm like, I'm opening like a small, like a mini club. Uh, would I be able to purchase some from you? And they were like, yeah, it's super expensive because we have to ship it across the ocean, but it's available. So like once a month, I would drive out to uh, Long Island and meet this hacker lady in an Applebee's parking lot Whoa. and just load up a van and drive it back. But the problem, everybody loved it. People would come to Boston just for... Club Mate, which I thought was 
psychotic, mm. but uh, nonetheless uh, <laughs> uh, pleased that we had uh, tapped into this. But the issue was, is you're relying on a, uh, you know, a hacker collective to be your beverage dis distributor. And the pricing was really, really overinflated uh, just because the logistics of the situation and also they would run out uh, relentlessly. And then I had this thought like, well, how difficult would it be to make our own version? And I kind of, I pitched the idea around to a couple friends. Everybody was really into the idea. And then I'm like, okay, well, how are we actually going to make it? Mm -hmm. I went to like a couple of these, like kind of like art, you know, there's like an artisanal version of, you know, everything in Brooklyn, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, artisanal, you know, uh, cotton balls. Yeah. Or so you can find somebody makes, you know, handcrafted cotton balls for like $17 each or something. So we found like the soda version of that. And I went to a, a bunch of these kind of like Portlandia people that make <laughs> their own expensive sodas. And they just didn't yeah. really see the vision because you have to be kind of in the techno world. To do so. And then I remembered this kid that I knew from like, you know, 15 years ago here that his father is like a, a guy from the Bronx who was in the like flavor development world for beverages. And I hit him up and I was like, yo, man, it's, it's John. I know it's been a long time, but uh, I have a question. And he's like, yeah, bro, we can make this like... Uh, comparatively yeah. easily and we can also produce it at a rate that's way cheaper than what you're paying for club mate and most importantly mm -hmm. uh it'll be uh what do you call it uh, uh what's the word for regular like uh consistent yeah we can we can consistently have it mm -hmm. and so uh we we started this uh beverage company nice and also like you said uh, in an interview that you, you know, the ingredients are organic, like how, Correct, yeah. like, but how can you still be, cause it, it would, it costs a lot of money. I feel like to have, you know, good ingredients, like no crap. Sure. Yeah. So how do you manage, uh, like financially, like, is it an uh, obstacle? I'm sorry, what was the last part? Is it an obstacle to, like, uh, the business to... Yeah, I mean, we ran into definitely some obstacles with, uh, you know, what, like any business or world from the outside, everything looks way easier mm -hmm. than it actually is. And then once you get into it, there's, like, 50 billion regulations that you never thought about, stuff like, oh, you can, you have to pasteurize mm -hmm. certain ingredients a certain way and it can only be in certain bottles or cans Whoa. with certain carbonation levels and certain ingredients are not technically organic uh, certified or vegan certified even though there's no animal products or you know there's there's no method which most of us would call uh non-organic or whatever mm -hmm. but uh yeah i mean we 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 kind of figured it out and in large part because i i was lucky to know this guy who's uh you know that's his family business and they've uh really uh spent a lot a lot of time uh learning those lessons you know be, before me and my friends came up with our little novel idea. And do you feel like, you know, your experience running like clubs uh, informed like uh, the business side of this, pro this company in a way? Yeah, I mean, well, we do probably 80% of our volume uh, is related to dance music. Oh, wow. So, I, I mean, I, I would have never had the idea or I wouldn't have been able to succeed uh without my dance music experience yeah. or connections um yeah and but is it like something you want to 
continue like the business? Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to continue it. I would like to find a way to, you know, really make money off of it. We don't, you know, I don't make a lot of money <laughs> with any of like the the things I do. But uh, with, you know, I, I'm sure you've seen this, like, you know, when uh, I think you and I were kind of having our like golden era of yeah. like dance music. Yeah. And uh, in the U.S., it was like almost exclusively based in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. right? But now like there's all these, you know, the, the kind of stuff the 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 little scenes and you know little parties and stuff we were involved in let's say 12 years ago there's versions of that popping up in miami and like mm -hmm. tulsa and all these small towns all over the u.s and all over the world for mm -hmm. uh whatever it's worth and this to me is like uh you know, personally, very, very exciting because one, I think we're kind of like spoiled in in New York City with uh, everything we have access to now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there, because of that, people are like a little more jaded. But in these smaller towns, smaller scenes mm -hmm. all over the world, people are really, really excited about this stuff yeah. and are kind of forced to be more innovative, not only from an artistic perspective, but from a, like, uh, maybe like a cultural and business perspective too. But mm -hmm. I guess what I was trying to say is in theory, we could expand, uh, the soda brand to these other places that also have some sort of connection mm -hmm. with Yerba Mate. And I'm interested in trying to figure out a way to do that, but yeah. it's, it's there's some, uh, you know, logistical uh, obstacles, but um, there's uh, there's potential out there, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, and also like from a, like you know a, a consumer standpoint, yeah, like many people in uh, nightlife and music stop drinking. Sure, yeah. So having the club, you know, having mm -hmm. the club mate is such a good alternative. Yes. And. Uh, I wish like clubs have more, you know, like uh, yeah. options. Like the club mate is great. Like if you're, like every time I DJ, I have to to drink it before yeah. just to get the energy and just have something to drink that is not water. Sure. Um, well, I mean, in the industry in general, there's a big push for uh, NA non-alcoholic beverages there's like these non-alcoholic kind of spirits companies yeah. popping up and i think the reality is like, <laughs> like for me as a as a uh you know somebody who runs venues yeah the less people are drinking that's bad that's bad for yeah. us from a business perspective but i fully support it yeah. as a human being because like why do we just have to like chug you know alcohol yeah. all night and day in order to 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 make music work yeah. uh so i fully support kind of the trend with this these uh you know younger people and older people too kind of exploring uh non-alcoholic uh um beverage options so do you think there is a different way to make money as a club that doesn't come from the drinks yeah, I think there's probably lots of ways. I don't think most people have been very successful at kind of yeah. uh, modernizing it or whatever. You know, kind of the big thing to think about is like the world that, uh, you know, d dance, the dance music universe is mm -hmm. gigantic now. Uh, I mean, I guess it's always been pretty big but right now there's people from all over the world uh you know with all types of backgrounds and you know political beliefs or whatever that are just obsessed with dance music mm -hmm. i do feel like you know 
Bergsonist and some of the stuff I've done has always been like uh, really kind of like cutting edge underground comparatively, mm. at least. And one of the problems, there, there's a lot of good things about, I guess, the, the scenes that we've been involved with. But one of the things that's not great is our people don't like to financially support yeah, yeah. Uh, as much as maybe some other uh, scenes or communities yeah. do which is you know part of the essence of it maybe but for right now i'm like okay people are drinking less the only practical thing to do is go up on the cover mm -hmm. but people don't really want to go up on the cover right now mm -hmm. uh with the economy as well and i get that is i also understand that but you know a lot of people uh you know playing around with like paid memberships and yeah. stuff like that. I haven't figured out what the, uh, uh, you know, what that future might look like. And I'm not sure that anybody has yet either. I think we should all be open-minded. Mm -hmm. And I think that we all should also keep in mind that like nobody's really making money yeah. from this stuff right now. Some people are paying their bills yeah. and there's a few exceptions of, you know, we all know some artists that, uh, you know, are making, you know, $8,000 a, a DJ set or oh, something wow. mm -hmm. and some clubs that are, you know, just really printing money right now, but they're, mm -hmm the exceptions mm -hmm. so i think it's important to think like you know all these places and all these artists that we feel so connected to and mm -hmm. you know for some of us there's like certain artists that have really you know are, are part of you know some of the best moments of my life or yeah. maybe a venue or a collective or a visual artist or whatever, but they can't sus necessarily sustain themselves with no money mm. at all. So I try to, you know, probably like you, uh, you know, we, we, we have the option of being on most of the guest lists mm. that we want to, but I try to remind myself that I'm not, you know, paying anybody's bills by, mm. uh, you know, showing up on the guest list somewhere and you know yeah getting a free drink or whatever um, yeah it's so true so uh what's next for you what's next for <laughs> me yeah i'm uh, right now i'm trying to uh focus on uh uh improving uh i guess sort of the the business side of of the things that I'm involved with so we can keep them sustainable and, and mm -hmm. running. I don't have any uh, ambitious plans uh, beyond that right now. Mm -hmm. I want to, uh, you know, run my two spots mm -hmm. uh, and kind of figure out a way to keep them open, obviously. And at the same time, you know, put forward, I guess, like a product uh, that uh, we really feel good about and that we feel is representing uh, New York City uh, and, you know, pushing it forward, I suppose. Mm -hmm. That's, I guess, kind of my focus is how can we build lineups and events that are uh, not only going to get people enough people inside to, to have a good time with that social element, but are doing more than just, uh, you know, kind of the status quo mm -hmm. artistically, which is a, a very difficult balance to hit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, I'm going to fight to the end, I think. Nice. Well, thank you so much, John. Yeah, this was thank like, you. <laughs> this was such a nice dive in into like your multi hats uh, person. <laughs> I don't know, character. But yeah, I'll make sure to like uh, 
um, uh, add all the links in the right. de description. And uh, uh, are there any parties coming up at Paragon that like you're excited about or? Well, I don't know when this is going to air, but uh, the, the people, or I guess the nights I'm really excited about, and this is coming from a, obviously a very biased perspective, are um, the residents that at, at Paragon, mm -hmm. the people we've made uh, residents. I do think that New York City is uh, a very, very difficult place to kind of make money uh with bookings and stuff because it's so oversaturated but mm. i really believe that like the the talent pool in new york city is by far the best in the world yeah, I agree. uh there's so many really super kind of future thinking mm. um producers and uh artists out there djs musicians mm -hmm. everything i think that we really have the absolute best of the best here mm -hmm. there's a lot of problems in new york city mm -hmm. relentless problems with like <laughs> the industry and nightlife it never stops yeah. but in terms of like uh like uh really forward thinking uh innovative talent i don't think there's any place that compares so i guess i'm plugging uh you know the resident uh artist at uh at paragon you know from uh you know the the uh classic architect joey beltram mm -hmm. to question mark who's much younger and burrell the great and mm -hmm. tiger paw Mm -hmm. all these people uh they're they're some of my favorites yeah. to, to see and that's why we uh we're working with them now nice well thank you so much yeah thank you very much <laughs> yeah <Have a> <laughs>